Right, welcome to you all for our uh, regular Saturday evening uh, lecture. We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Simon Wilson. Simon, as many of you may know, has uh, recently joined the staff as such, haven't you, for the MA um, here. So we're very, very pleased to welcome Simon. And Simon's a real expert on uh, um, the mysteries of Britain and has spoken and um, talked very much on this subject. And I won't uh, um, take up materials that are going to be discussed here, but it's an absolutely interesting issue, the mystical traditions of Britain itself and the mystical traditions of our landscape. And so Simon's going to talk on John Wood and the cosmological vision of Albion. Please welcome Simon. Thank you very much. First of all, after the handout question, the heating question, is it too hot or too cold or neither? Is that, are you okay. comfortable? Yeah. Comfortable. Yes. Good. <laughs> John Wood the Elder, native of Bath, described a landscape of the imagination, an imaginal landscape, some might say, in which one might learn wisdom and contemplate the very source of all. Riding through the countryside of southwest England in the 18th century, he saw the great prehistoric monuments of Stonehenge, Avebury, Stanton Drew, and he knew them to be places of initiation into the highest mysteries of creation, built by Druidic Pythagoreans, or Pythagorean Druids, under the instruction of a legendary king of Britain, a sorcerer, whose powers had transported him through the heavens to Greece, where he was welcomed as an equal by none other than Pythagoras himself. John Wood deciphered the language of Stonehenge, Stanton Drew, Avebury, and he heard them speak of the native mysteries of Britain, and those too of Greece, before his eyes, the, these mysteries came alive, and he beheld, in the landscape, the presence of a perfect cosmos of harmony and pristine truth, an Edenic landscape, where, for those with eyes to see, the One, the origin of all, was manifest, walking in the garden, as it were, on England's mountains green, <coughs> still there now, before his eyes. His vision elevated to godlike heights. John Wood himself became an adept in these mysteries, and he went on to create his own architecture of revelation in Beth, which thus, in part at least, became a cosmic city haunted by the tangible presence of the divine, a place for modern mystics to seek their own vision. John Wood, this seer, this prophet of a British revelation, this builder of dreams, was born in Bath in 1704. Remarkably little is known about him, especially for 17 years or so of his life. And in fact, and this, as far as I know, is the only known portrait of him. He's the gentleman standing on the right. Uh, wearing the rather drab clothes of a journeyman, a jobbing architect. Um, and even this, if you look at it, I think you'll agree, it hardly looks like a portrait of a flesh and blood person. Those are not the lineaments of real physiognomy. It's, it's more of a, a rather crude cartoon than anything else. So we don't really know much about his biography. We don't even really know much about what he looked like. Probably didn't look like that for a start. But it's his idiosyncratic ideas and the architecture which they produced which remain. Not the detail of his humdrum, of the humdrum merely mortal man. In looking through his eyes at Stonehenge, Stanton Drew, Avebury and Bath, to, we may perhaps see what is in any case the essence of the man. 
We know that in the 1720s, he was living in London as a craftsman, a joiner, in fact. Through contacts that he made there, he seems quickly to have risen to something a little bit more prestigious. He became an architect and what we would today call a property developer. It's often claimed that while he was in London, he became a Freemason. Certainly many of his associates were Masons, and it would have been natural for an architect to join a fraternity which drew its central symbols from building and geometry. But while it is indeed likely that he was a Freemason, there's no actual proof that that was the case. In 1727, John Wood returned to Bath, supremely confident of his mission to transform the city. His confidence, some called it arrogance, I think, was justified. For his vision succeeded in transforming Bath and making it, in the eyes of many, into one of the most beautiful cities in Britain. His work provided the template for Bath's streetscape, replacing the rather provincial attempts at Baroque architecture with uh, Palladian grandeur which outshone even the buildings of London. Between 17... There we go. Between 1728 and 1736, he built Queen's Square. Queen's, this is a, a drawing that John Wood made himself, a map of Bath. And Queen's Square is there in the upper right-hand corner. You can see he gave it great prominence in his map. He was not a modest man. He also built South Parade. This is part of South Parade. Just a few houses there. Between 1743 and 1749. But his masterpiece was the circus. He died in, in 1754. He died in 1754, just three months after the first stone was laid on his masterpiece, the circus. His son, who is also confusingly called John Wood, continues the work following his father's precise directions and it was finished in 1768. It's extraordinary achievements, I think, the circus. For Wood, it was a portal into, an, into a, a visionary, an imaginal realm of cosmic and even divine perfection. And if we want to truly understand it, we have to look more closely at Wood's ideas. Wood's achievements in his city of birth are immense, but it's only by looking at his writings that we be begin to get the measure of his vision and its place in a whole transformed, transfigured, enchanted landscape. Eager to communicate his vision, he wrote several books and pamphlets. His three major works were The Origin of Buildings, that's from 1741, an essay towards a description of the city of Bath that was first published in 1742 and 1743. It's a multi-volume work. And Choir Gower, vulgarly called Stonehenge, in 1747. And in each of these works, Wood set himself the same aim, to connect Britain's prehistoric stone monuments to an original primordial revelation of divine harmony and truth. However, the books do differ considerably in the way that they set about this task, and they even contradict each other. In the first, The Origin of Building, Wood traces the origin of the so-called classical forms of building to the tabernacle which Moses built to God's precise instructions after the meeting on Mount Sinai, and to the first temple in Jerusalem, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, 
Persians, Greeks and Romans then all stole their architecture from the Jews without acknowledging the theft, is his argument. The pagans, in fact, perpetrated a massive act of plagiarism and fraud. And to this list, the list of Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Medes, Persians, etc. To this list, we can also add the Druids in Britain. Wood attributes the great ancient monuments of Britain to the Druids. This may seem fanciful now, but at the time, it was the standard theory having first been put forward in the 17th century by John Aubrey in his huge work, The Monumenta Britannica. Wood then naturally goes on to accuse the Druids of the same deception, the same contrary as all the other indigenous peoples in the ancient world. And he writes, and I'm quoting him here, if we were to scrutinise all the works of the Druids, we should find them to have been copied from the works of the Jews. Under close scrutiny, then, our prehistoric monuments can be made to disclose their secrets. They are proof of the primacy of the Judeo-Christian revelation. They encode this truth in their very proportions, based as they are on the tabernacle and the first temple at Jerusalem, Stonehenge, Kalanish. Castle rig. They all have their origins in the geometry dictated to Moses by God. The British Isles from north to south, from east to west, are filled with the primordial outlines of the Judeo-Christian revelation. Bearing witness to this truth, they become part of the Holy Land, at least architecturally Briti the British Isles <coughs> becomes part the Holy Land architecturally, despite all the attempts by the sneaky heathens to cover this fact up. <laughs> Wood, in fact, manages to have his cake and indeed eat it. The megalithic remains of England, having the same divine sources as those of the other great world civilizations, can justly be regarded with a sense of pride but at the same time, they tell a story of massive pagan imposture and dishonesty. And just a year or so later, in his next important work, an essay towards a description of Beth, Wood modifies this position ever so slightly, while still stressing the essentially fraudulent na uh, nature of the native British religion. He tells the story as as far as I'm aware, it's a completely imaginary story of Druidry in Britain. I'm going to show you a picture of a, of a Druid. It's actually, there we go. That's actually Bladud. He tells the story, a completely imaginary story of Druidry in Britain. He claims that it was introduced in the 5th century BC by a powerful British king powerful <coughs> British king called Beladud. His name is also pronounced Bladud. His name is also pronounced Beladud. I prefer to say Beladud because it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, that's actually an illustration from his essay on the city of Bath. So it's introduced in the 5th century by this gentleman, Beladud. And it has its roots in Greece. Bladud, we are told, spent some time studying philosophy with Pythagoras in Athens. And when he returned, he brought four philosophers, uh, four philosophers of the Pythagorean school with him. And the Greeks each became the heads of the four orders of Druidry, which was thus fundamentally a form of Pythagoreanism. The connection of British Druidry to Pythagoras, who is one of the great founding fathers of Greek and thus Western esoteric thinking, it may seem rather strange, but in fact, and strangely, it was entirely traditional. And it goes back to some of the very earliest writings on the Druids. 
in the 3rd century, for example, 3rd century AD, Hippolytus of Rome could assert, and I'm quoting Hippolytus of Rome here, could assert that Druidical science was based on Pythagorean principles. And even Wood's story of a great legendary king of Britain visiting Athens and returning with four philosophers was not, as he himself admitted, original. What Wood did do, what he did contribute to this story, was the notion that these four, that these Pythagorean mystics then went on to build the great megalithic monuments of Britain. The great stone circles of Stanton Drew, for example, these are part of the, the remnants of one of the stone circles of Stanton Drew, I think there were three of them. The great stone circles of Stanton Drew, for instance, were built by the Druids as their college. And they constitute, in their disposition, and the number of their stones, the disposition of the three different uh, circles, and the, number, the, the uh, number and positioning of each of the stones, Wood wrote, they, they constitute a perfect model of the Pythagorean system of the planetary world for the edification and instruction of neophytes. The system that he's describing is heliocentric, with the three main circles representing the sun, the earth, and the moon, and then various other individual stones standing for Mercury, Venus, Mars, <coughs> Jupiter, Saturn. Wood argues that these these different elements, the individual stones, the circles, are all precisely placed in relation to each other, conforming in their distances, in the distances to the actual, sorry, the distances between the actual heavenly bodies. So it's a scale model of the solar system. Wood seems to be describing a perfectly ordered cosmology, picked out in stone in the English countryside by learned disciples of Pythagoras to create a kind of harmonious landscape where one may hope to achieve wisdom. And this was indeed pure Pythagoreanism. In the words of two modern day commentators on Pythagoras, it was after all after all it was Pythagoras who first called the universe cosmos, a word whose Greek root implies both order and adornment. For him the survey of the heavens revealed, Greek, uh, revealed great beauty through the arrangement of the stars and the order inherent in their revolutions. The heavens embodied for him the pure numbers, perfect figures and motions, and true relationships that exist among the essences <coughs> of things and which are perceptible only to reason and thought. Eternal and unchanging. Such essences are the source of wisdom. The only difference between Pythagoras' teaching methods and these huge Druidic monuments is one of scale. For the learned, the arrangement of the stones at Stanton Drew manifests the eternal archetypal truth of a divinely ordered cosmos which may otherwise be obscured by accident or misperception. For Wood, however, this vision would only have been available to a handful of British initiates. King Bladud and his Pythagoreans, which sounds like the name of a band, <laughs> King Bladud and his Pythagoreans, he writes, abused their knowledge of natural forces to intimidate and enslave the general populace. Bladud, for example, used the natural curative properties of the waters of Bath to appear to perform acts of magic and, Wood writes, to make the people believe him a person sent from heaven. Wood is essentially following the same strategy he used in the origin of building. He's describing prehistoric monuments which bear witness 
to both incredible learning, great Pythagorean structures spreading across southwest England, and also devious imposture. Even his claim that the architecture of British prehistory has its origins in Pythagorean learning does not contradict his earlier arguments that it was stolen from the Jews. We can assume that the Greeks, underhand heathens as they were, would have stolen their expertise from the Hebrews and then subverted it for their own sneaky pagan ends. By the time he published Choir Gow, vulgarly called Stonehenge, in 1747, however, Wood seems to have changed his mind. And I take this work to, be, to represent his final, his definitive view of these matters. He now drops much of the Judeo-Christian background, and with it he drops the accusation of duplicity. He now describes a transfigured, a transformed Bladud, free of all duplicity, a figure not merely matching, but far surpassing even Pythagoras. Under his direction, South West England becomes a spiritual centre, perhaps the spiritual centre, where the divine source of all could be known and experienced. Britain was now not part of the Holy Land, it was the Holy Land. Would that found the figure of King Bladud in Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Great Britain. It's an immensely influential work of the mythopaic imagination, written around 1136, in which Geoffrey told the stories of all the kings of this island, from the legendary founder of Britain, Brutus of Troy, through the 76 mythic monuments who reigned before the time of Caesar, and then up to the 7th century. Geoffrey's text is the source of much of the legendary associated with Britain, particularly the, source, uh, the, the story of King Arthur. King Bladud, we learn in Geoffrey, is one of the very earliest monarchs, the 10th in line from Brutus, in fact. He was the founder of Bath, which would have caught John Wood's eye. And according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, Bladud also fostered the arts of necromancy in his realm. He built himself a huge pair of wings, and with these wings he flew across his lands and surveyed them. Eventually, as all artificial pairs of wings do, they failed him, and he came plunging to his death over Trino Vantum, which we now know as London. So Geoffrey's basic outline then, Wood had already added in his previous work the notions that Bledod had visited Pythagoras and had returned with four Pythagorean philosophers to found Druidry and to build the stone circles. But now, in Choir Gower, he plays what I think I can probably call his master strain. He identifies this legendary king with the equally legendary Abaris the Hyperborean. Abaris was an important figure from the legends of Pythagoras. And he appears, for example, in the biographies of Pythagoras, written by the Neoplatonists Porphyry and Iamblichus. Abaris was a priest of Apollo, a holy man, who was initiated by Pythagoras into his teachings. Wood found compelling evidence that he was the same person as Bladud. Firstly, like Bladud, he was from Hyperborea, the land behind the north wind. That's what Hyperborea means. The land behind the north wind, which was sometimes identified with Britain. And secondly, also like Bladud, the Baris could fly albeit with the aid of a magical dart or arrow and not a pair of wings. And in fact, in this drawing, we see uh, Bladud as a baris with his magical arrows and his bow. 
Wood's bladud stroke abaris, however, was much more powerful and charismatic, a much more powerful and charismatic figure than a mere follower of Pythagoras. Although he travelled to Greece for improvement, as Wood writes, he was, as Wood also writes, in so many things the master of Pythagoras. For one thing, unlike Pythagoras, Bladud was a great prophet, and he proceeded to teach the philosopher the arts of prophecy when he arrived in Greece. Unlike Pythagoras, Bladud was a great prophet, and he proceeded to teach the philosopher the arts of prophecy when he arrived in Greece. And Wood says, after Bladud had made himself famous all over Greece for his oracles, he was dignified with the title of Abaris, and then built temples in that country. Even the Delphic temple itself appears to have been a work of his. Pythagoras was a philosopher, a lover of wisdom, as the word suggests. And by exercising his intelligence in the highest sense of the word, he believed that he had intuited the eternal, unchanging nature of the cosmos and traced its laws to a supreme instance, the One. He was able to initiate Bledud into this highly structured and essentially arithmetical vision with its origin in the movements of the heavenly bodies. But Bledud added to this rather cool, very rational vision something much wilder prophetic inspiration, not from above, not from the movements of the heavenly bodies, but from below, rising from below, like the fumes of the decomposing python inhaled by the sibyl at Delphi. These two elements, the rational and the a-rational, the cosmic and the chthonic, Bladud then combined in his great works around that. After learning all that he could in Greece and transmitting in turn the mysteries of prophecy to the Greeks, Bladud then returns to Britain. He returned to Bath. There he succeeded his father as king of Britain. He founded the Druids. And then he went on to build the great stone circles of the southwest. In this project, he was aided by those four Pythagorean, learned Pythagoreans I mentioned before who, we now learn, had fled Athens in around 480 BC. These constructions, writes Wood, emblematically preserved the mysteries and the philosophy of the Druids, who, as we know, wrote nothing down. The implication is that since Wood has the key to these great structures, he can revive the Druidic truths and he can bring about their re renaissance in Britain. Wood argues that Bath was the metropolitan seat of the Druids, while Stanton Drew was their university. Wood repeats his argument that Stanton Drew was, quoting again, a stupendous model of the planetary world. But... But it was in a cavern in the nearby Mendips, known as Wookie Hole, this being the same hole, that the Druids carried out their initiations into the mysteries of their religion and learning. Those are Wood's words again. This cave was enlarged by removing great blocks of stones, which were then great blocks of stone, which were then used to build those stone circles at Stanton Drew. The cosmic revelation of Stanton Drew is thus made up of stones torn from the subterranean world, thereby combining the clear and beautiful outlines of the Pythagorean world with the darkness of the underworld, as Vladud himself united philosophy and darker prophetic utterance. Wood's main theme in 
fire gower. However, the Stonehenge itself, this is a, a plan that wood made of Stonehenge. And he emphasises that his insights into Stonehenge are based not on fantasy, but on very careful surveys of the circle, unparalleled in their rigour, objectivity and accuracy, he says. He goes, in fact, into exhaustive, and I'm sorry that I have to say rather baffling detail over his survey methods to convince the reader that this was a truly scientific enterprise scientifically conducted. This is, after all, the 18th century, the age of enlightenment. But here, science and empiricism, they're strange and peculiar fruit indeed. For the result of Wood's inquiry is a Stonehenge, which is at once a cosmology and a cosmogony. That is, it is simultaneously a model of creation, manifest creation as we see it, in all its harmonious diversity, and, at the same time, a symbol of the primal oneness, the monad, the source of all, which holds united within it every possibility, and thus gives rise to all that exists and can exist. This first oneness, this principial oneness or unity, was described by the Pythagorean philosopher Theon of Smyrna. Unity is the principle of all things and the most dominant of all that is. All things emanate from it, and it emanates from nothing. It is indivisible, and it is everything in power. It is immutable and never departs from its own nature through multiplication. One times one is one. Everything that is intelligible and not yet created exists in it. The nature of ideas, God himself the soul, the beautiful, and the good, and every intelligible essence such as beauty itself, justice itself, equality itself. For we conceive each of these things as being one and as existing in itself. Stonehenge for wood is, as it were, this oneness, this place which contains everything. As such, everything meets everything at Stonehenge. This world, the underworld, the heavens, past, present and future. Stonehenge is everywhere, everything and every time. But given the ungraspable complexity of his vision, it's not surprising that Wood's writings are dense and practically impossible to summarise, I find possible to summarise any way, so many apologies. Um, I fail to follow him at all and many times, but this is only to be expected, I think. After all, he's describing a work which unites everything and relates it to the one which contains all. As this is inevitably, uh, inevitably a monument in which everything is connected to everything, it's impossible to know where to begin. But I'd like to outline what uh, appear to me to be the most important elements of his vision of a representation of the unrepresentable. For Wood, Stonehenge is principally a lunar temple, a copy, in fact, of the circle which, in his view, symbolises the moon at Stanton Drew. The number of its great pillars, of Stonehenge's great pillars, encodes, for instance, the two ancient lengths of lunar months, 30 days and 29 days, respectively. However, at the same time, it has a whole range of significant solar aspects, and it also represents the Earth and the Earth's movement through the heavens. I'm not going to attempt to go through Wood's reasoning, so I'll just take my word for it. In essence, wood stone henge represents an attempt to reconcile all or most aspects of the cosmos into a completely harmonious whole. It's a model of the movements of the sun, 
the moon and the earth in relation to each other, movements which apparently click into perfect proportion and alignment every 19 years in the so-called metonic cycle. Um, as I am not going to explain the metonic cycle, instead I have some rather nice images to, to look at which illustrate the metonic cycle. And uh, for those at ICC, they will naturally be clear to you what they, they mean. Uh, they're from the 9th century, and that's to be found in uh, a manuscript in Bavaria. The metonic cycle, which reconciles the solar year and the lunar months. According to Wood, Stonehenge encodes in its design this coming together, which he goes on to say, and I'm quoting him now, was what the ancients called the harmony of the spheres. As Wood goes on to say, the stones, in their positioning and colour, reconcile and reconcile and bring into perfect balance several other crucial oppositions elements of earth and fire, for example. Also day and night, light and dark, even good and evil. Stonehenge, in addition, includes in its infinite oneness the underworld, this world, and the heavens. The moon was venerated there, he tells us, according, uh, he tells us, in three aspects, as queen of the underworld, queen of earth, and queen of the heavens. Finally, Stonehenge manifests the past and the future in the present, bringing all times together into one whole. With this aspect, we're entering into the darker realms of the prophetic spirit, with which Bledud enriched Pythagorean philosophy. The spirits of the dead were raised at Stonehenge so that they might be perceived here and now, and the future was seen in prophecy, and all was held together in the eternal dance of the giant stones. Stonehenge then makes present in the Wiltshire countryside the ideal Pythagorean harmony of the cosmos, as it holds together all in perfect reconciliation. It is also the one the oneness, the primal unity, which gives rise to all that has existed, exists now, and will exist in the future. It is, among other things, the perfect place, or non-place, for Bladud's magic arts. All this makes Britain, for wood, truly a place of revelation. It is the place where initiates since the native Druidic religion, wandering the huge stones and the huge circles of stone, would have actually experienced, would have lived and known with their whole being cosmic harmony. Equally, they would have experienced the presence of the One, right there on Salisbury Plain. Over time, Moving amongst the stones, they would have gradually come to know every possible combination of the myriad aspects held together in delicate balance in the circle, where everything is connected to everything else. Belonging to a priesthood which committed nothing to writing, they would have been expected to memorise all that they saw, to learn it by heart, until they carried the stones within them. The adepts would thus carry in their being the entire cosmos and also the one from which it springs. Each of them would in fact become a true macrocosm, encompassing all, even the future. It is our world, the world that the non-initiate inhabits, which is the microcosm. It's clear then that Stonehenge is proof for wood of a native British mystery and philosophy school, which puts all other systems and all other revelations into the shade, including the Judeo-Christian tradition he celebrated in his earlier works. He sees how this revelation spread 
throughout the world from the southwest of Britain. He writes, Druidism immediately spread itself from Britain eastward to the utmost corners of the earth instead of coming from the extremity of the eastern world to us and would thereby explicitly reverse the traditional belief professed by many mystery and wisdom schools that ex oriente lux, light, enlightenment proceeds from the east. These revelations have hidden, have lain hidden in plain sight for millennia because there have been no adepts to decipher the monuments which embody them. Wood, however, seems to have believed that his careful scientific survey of Stonehenge and Stanton Drew had served to initiate him into the mystery. <coughs> he carried them, he carried the, stir the circles, the stones, the mysteries within him, an almost omniscient macrocosm holding all together. He was the new Bladud, the new Archdruid, the head of a new British revelation. His writings may even mark the reascent of these mysteries so that they may shine forth throughout the entire world once more. Ex Occidente Lux. Enlightenment may proceed once more from the West. I think we can pause now, step back a little, and ask a quite legitimate question. Just what the hell is going on here? <laughs> or another one. Just what was this man thinking? And one answer to those questions, I think, is to see... John Wood, not as an eccentric, but as part of an ancient tradition, which sees Britain as the site of a native revelation, independent of all, or at least most, other revelations. This was a vision which has had many prophets, of which Wood is by no means the most prominent. Most commonly, it has taken the form of a belief that Britain's deep spiritual traditions exist independently of the structures and the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. Wood's part of the world, there, Somerset, had often been the theatre for such visions, and it continues to be so. Since the mid-13th century, at least, for example, the Abbey at Glastonbury had claimed to have been founded in AD 63 by 12 disciples under Joseph of Arimathea, who themselves had been dispatched by the Apostle Philip. This made Glastonbury Abbey the first church in Britain, but just as importantly, it meant that the British church, by dint of its foundation, had its own line of apostolic succession, separate from that of the Church of Rome, but just as venerable, just as legitimate. The implications were immense. And during John Wood's lifetime, Ideas like this were particularly prevalent in his own area of research in antiquarianism. The leading figure in this field, much towards chagrin it must be said, was undoubtedly the great William Stukeley. The great William Stukeley, doctor, clergyman, <coughs> Freemason, artist, prophet, whose beautifully evocative drawings of ancient sites, such as this one, enchant even to this day. If anybody, it was Stukeley who can be said to have popularised the notion that the native British religion was the one true primordial and universal religion. In Stonehenge, a temple restored to the British Druids, which was published in 1740, Stonehenge, a temple restored to the British Druids, for instance, Stukeley explained, and I'm quoting, when I first began these studies about the Druid antiquities, I plainly discerned the religion professed in these places was the first simple patriarchal religion, 
and he goes on. There was but one religion at first, pure and simple. That's another of Stukeley's drawings. It's a British druid. For Stukeley, this primordial religion was brought to Britain by the Phoenicians when it was still pristine and in its purest form, practically, in fact, Christian. William Stukeley wrote, these famous philosophical priests, philosophic priests, the Druids, came hither as a Phoenician colony in the very earliest times, even as soon as Tyre was founded, during the life of the patriarch Abraham, or very soon after. Therefore, they brought along with them the patriarchal religion, which was so extremely like Christianity that, in effect, it differed from it only in this. They believed in a Messiah who was to come into the world, as we believe in him that is come. Although not originally British, this Judeo-Druidic religion, having arrived so early in Britain, was preserved there in its purest form. Stukeley made it his mission to revive awareness of it and to demonstrate that in fact it had not died out but was still being practiced. My intent is to restore the first and great idea of the deity who has carried on the same regular and golden chain of religion from the beginning to this day, to warm our hearts into that true sense of religion which keeps the medium between ignorant superstition and learned free thinking, between enthusiasm and the rational worship of God, which, no, uh, which is nowhere upon earth done, in my judgment, better than in the Church of England. <laughs> <laughs> Anglicans, in other words, what he's saying is that Anglicans were Druids, the Druids by another name, and they're continuing this pure and purely moderate worship of God, which had been abandoned by the superstitious papists on the one hand and fanatical Protestants, Calvinists on the other hand. Thus it was Britain and not Rome, which was the true seat of Christianity. Wood loathed Stukeley and was determined not to be outshone by him. In this, I think, I think, in this perhaps we can see the origin of his zeal to outdo his rival by making Britain the actual origin of a primal universal revelation. So Stukeley, for instance, being an Anglican clergyman, was essentially a Druid, then Wood was the arch-Druid of Ladud for our times, revealing to the benighted eyes the true national religion. The idea that Britain was the Holy Land, or a place specially selected for revelation, already so well established, did not end, <coughs> did not die with Wood and Stukeley. William Blake, the great poet and prophet, clearly drawing on Stukeley, could write in the Jerusalem was and is the emanation of the giant Albion. It is true and cannot be controverted. I have to go all prophetic, really. Yes. <laughs> ye are united, O ye inhabitants of earth, in one religion, the religion of Jesus, the most ancient, the eternal, and the everlasting gospel. All things begin and end in Albion's ancient druid rocky shore. It's one of my favourite phrases. I love that. All things begin and end in Albion's ancient. The idea that Britain is a land of revelation has not gone away. It's found throughout the work of the very, very English John Michel, who we see here in this painting on the cover of a collection of uh, essays of his. Very much a kind of a new druid, a new bladud with a measuring rod. He's got a measuring rod in his hand there, replacing the staff or the bow of the druid or bladud.
And it's an idea, Britain as a land of revelations, that uh, we find particularly in, in Michel's writings on Glastonbury. Glastonbury for Michel is the Holy Land, and its revelations are only just beginning. He writes, these are times of revelations. Glastonbury still conceals many mysteries, but the process of disclosure has already begun, and the first revelations are precisely those which are most appropriate to our present level of understanding. John Wood very easily finds a place in this tradition of what we may call spiritual patriotism, but this too does not really do him full justice. For whatever we may make of his theories, the real value of his works, I would argue, lies in their passionate attempt to grapple imaginatively with the past and with the difference of the past. And the same may be said of the writings of Stukeley, Michel and many others. Wood sees the ancient monuments of Britain as expressions of a mindset or consciousness which differs greatly from ours but which may still be available to us if we're willing to respond imaginatively to them. It's something which more academically respectable archaeologists failed to do for <coughs> you know, a couple of centuries, 150 years or so. There's a picture of barrow diggers from about 1838. That's just a stand-in for archaeologists. Wood's willingness to respond imaginatively to the past, although seriously flawed, was at least an attempt to respond to the past in its own terms, rather than just seeing it as an array of dead objects, things which might be added to a collection of other dead objects. More than that, the essential message of Wood's vision of Stonehenge is that we have to allow the past to change us, perhaps even to open us to revelation. The true legacy of Wood's antiquarian imagination, however, is undoubtedly his architecture. His architecture brings the Stonehenge revelation right into the centre of his beloved centre, of his beloved city of Bath, where it can still be seen if we're willing to make the effort. I'd like to talk very very briefly, coming to the end of my talk now, I'd like to talk very briefly about his masterpiece, The Circus. There we go. It's there that he most obviously encoded his ideas. The Circus is in fact Stonehenge brought up to date, a revelation of a cosmic order and the actual presence of the origin of all that is, right there amongst Georgian magnificence. It's his final statement concerning revelation and religion. As I said, he began work uh, on the circus in 1754, died after only, only three months after work had begun. His son, John Wood Jr., John Wood the Younger, uh, finished the work to his precise instructions in 1768 ensuring that his father's vision was realised in the impressive, but I find rather austere, Palladianism of the finished buildings. The acorns above the parapet, I don't know if you can see it there at the top, the, the acorns, the things that are not chimneys, um, proclaim the circus to be druidic. The oak was the totemic tree of the druids, and Wood uh, maintains that the Saxon name for Bath, Achmanchester, meant Oak Men's City. In other words, the city of the Druids. Stanton Drew, he said, meant o Oak Men's Town. So we're on sacred Druidic ground here, which anyone who raises their eyes to the level of the parapets will at once see. Perhaps here, too, the residents and the visitors may be initiated into the mysteries and learning of the Druids, if they will only look up. In its proportions and the number of the houses it contains, the circus represents both Stanton Drew and Stonehenge. One reads 
varying different es estimates of the diameter of the circus. I've read several different uh, accounts of the diameter. Some sources say it's 300 feet, some around 316 feet, some around 318 feet. Whatever, these are good approximations of Wood's measurements at both Stanton Drew and Stonehenge. In his essay on Beth, Wood gives the diameter of the lunar circle at Stanton Drew as 316 feet plus the thickness of the stones. While in Choir Gower, he, what he calls the first bank of earth surrounding Stonehenge is said to measure 312 feet in diameter, though in an earlier letter he had said it was 316 feet. The circus, like Stonehenge, incorporates in its structure the two ancient lengths of the months, 29 days and 30 days, and it does this very deftly. It's divided into, into a total of uh, 30 houses, but only 29 front doors open onto the circus itself, <laughs> as one door is around a corner in Bennett Street, these dimensions, these numbers, make the circus a lunar temple, a kind of Palladian Stonehenge, or a Georgian Stanton Drew. One wonders if the residents of the circle may be expected to fulfil their druidic responsibilities by venerating the moon in the three aspects which had been identified by Wood as Queen of the Underworld, Queen of Earth and Queen of the Heavens, and thereby reconcile and harmonise in Beth the three levels of existence. The circus, however, like Stonehenge, is by no means purely lunar in significance. It, too, is an emblem of perfect cosmic order. That house that I mentioned with the front door just around the corner is number 19, the number of the metonic cycle of 19 years, which reconciles solar year and the lunar month, and which Wood had called the harmony of the spheres, the moment when the mo movements of the sun, moon and earth click into perfect proportion and alignment. So the circus tells us that cosmic balance and order may be a little obscure and difficult to find. It's always there, just around the corner. <laughs> Wood's architecture emphasises, uh, emphasises the divine origin of this harmony. The circus displays the three main orders of uh, architecture, Doric columns for the ground floor, Ionic for the first, and then Corinthian for the second floor. In his origin of building, Wood had traced all three orders, not to classical sources, but the, to the divinely inspired tabernacle, and thence to Solomon's temple, which in the origin of building at least, he regarded as the peak of architectural perfection and a symbolic representation of the entire harmonious universe. The circus is thus a symbolic, but by no means literal, rebuilding of the temple, and it reconciles the Druidic Pythagorean with the Judeo-Christian. The circle hides one more layer of symbolism. Like Stonehenge, it goes beyond the beauty and the harmony of the cosmos to become a place where the one source of all is actually present and may be experienced. As I mentioned earlier, it's highly likely, it's not certain, but it's highly likely that Wood was a Freemason. Indeed, his interest in Solomon's temple may be derived from his membership of that order. The circus undoubtedly employs Masonic symbolism to represent the divine. The symbol in question is to be found in the royal arch degree. The degree enacts the discovery of the name of God while the ground of Solomon's temple is being cleared in preparation for the building of a new temple. One of the objects always present in the ritual space represents the name, represents this name within an arrangement of an equilateral triangle or Greek delta inside a circle. That's what you can see here. So you have the idea here of excavating and finding what the temple has, as it were, been hiding all the while beneath the surface, or going deep into the very principles and foundations of the cosmos, 
and finding that the whole of exist and finding what the whole of existence is contingent upon, or going deep into oneself and finding there the foundation of the true self, one's true personhood, and this ground of all being, always there, though obscured from profane eyes, is God. And this very same symbol appears in the basic plan of Wood's rebuilt temple. Seen from above, the circus consists of a circle with an equilateral triangle within it. Implied by the form of Wood's final building, in other words, is a revelation of the divine, <coughs> always there, within the cosmos and within each person, containing everything and giving existence to everything. John Wood's masterpiece, then, holds everything which can be in its circumference. It is a planet. It is the cosmos. It is a person's true self. It is the place where God is. The place that is no place, because it is everywhere. It's the place of initiation into these mysteries. And unlike, unlike Stanton Drew or Stonehenge, it is still pristine still intact, there, where revelation comes from, in the West, in the Holy Land, in England, there truly is a place of revelation. <laughs>